Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Sincock and we're talking about innovators and entrepreneurs, startups, those people that really put everything on the line because they could see they could make the world a better place. Yeah. And how's your week been, Troy? It's been incredible. In fact, I've been all over the place over the last you know, 10 days or so. I spoke at the Electronic Music Conference in Sydney and facilitated a session called The Future of Radio. It had uh, people from New Zealand, you know, Triple J in, in Sydney and a whole lot of other stations come together Um, and you know innovation is absolutely rife in the world of radio right now particularly with things like Apple CarPlay where you know currently you might be in a car listening to Radio Adelaide and then go home wake up in the morning your radio is still on Radio Adelaide with Apple CarPlay you basically end up with a home screen not dissimilar to your phone and if radio is not there, it means that people have to proactively choose radio. So for the industry, there's some real challenges around that mm. space and um, where we need to be to capture people's attention. And I think too that sort of feeds into what television is going through right now because of the fact that you know you've got all these streaming services and things like that, and people can get the on-demand content. Um, so there is huge challenges around media right now. Yeah, absolutely in all aspects. And the thing being, there's so many different platforms. You almost have to be on everyone. So it's how can you do that without spreading yourself too thin? Well, that's the hard part isn't it? Just actually pulling it all together and uh, and seeing, um, you know, how you can ensure that you're in front of the the right people at the right time. We've got a different kind of innovator on the show today. We certainly do. We've got Emma Hack. Now, she's an incredible artist who's innovating with a combination of painting, not only on canvas, she's doing body painting and she's also doing the photography as well. Uh, And she's actually worked on Gautier's number one hit. Somebody I used to know. That was a massive song, and that film clip was really incredible. And what an opportunity that was for her. I just can't imagine how incredibly good that experience would be for her, for yeah. somebody. Yeah. yeah, can't wait to hear more about that. Well, now here's Claire with more in news, including a robot dog, the quietest ever produced. What else have you got for us, Claire? Thank you, guys. Researchers in Denmark are repurposing old drugs to fight the current antibiotic resistant epidemic. The team at Aarhus University has found that a drug that's been used for over 20 years to treat multiple sclerosis can destroy gram-negative antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Gram-negative clusters are responsible for life-threatening infections, including pneumonia, septic shock and cystitis, which are often resistant to the usual antibiotics. The researchers have explained that the drug Copaxone can kill this type of bacteria in just a few minutes. This medical breakthrough is an important step in dealing with the widespread issue of some types of bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. According to a study initiated by the British government, in 2050, resistant bacteria will kill more people around the globe than cancer. It takes around 10 years for a new medicine to be tested and deemed safe for patient use. Let's hope more research can continue to uncover new ways of using old drugs to save lives. In China, a robot powered by artificial intelligence has passed the country's medical licensing exam, proving its potential to become a medical assistant. Robot Xiao Yi passed the exam with 456 points, which is 96 above a passing grade. It was created by China's leading AI developers, iFlyTech, who hope the robot can assist doctors. Originally, Xiao Yi was created to document and analyse information about patients. Now, its job is to improve the efficiency of patient care and treatment in the future. There has been worry over whether this type of robot could one day replace doctors, but iFlyTech has assured that they won't. The company is also planning to use this robot and other AI technology to advance cancer treatment and train new GPs. iFlyTech is also hoping the robot will provide much-needed care to those living in rural China, as there aren't many GPs and many patients believe a hospital can offer better service. The robot will officially launch in March next year, and who knows, maybe soon our healthcare professionals won't all be human. Speaking of robots, in the US, a company has created a robot dog that can help out around your house or office. Robotics and humanoids developer Boston Dynamics has unveiled its newest version of the Spot Mini, which seems like it belongs in a futuristic sci-fi movie. With a bright yellow protective casing, the 30 kilo Spot Mini looks and moves like a dog. It can climb stairs, crouch low, navigate its way around, extend its neck, grab things using its mouth, run and right itself when it falls over. It's so skilled that it can even perform household chores like packing the dishwasher, 
wonder if it could do my washing. Anyway, the completely electric Spot Mini can run for about 90 minutes after being charged and is the quietest robot the company has ever made. The robot is fitted with multiple sensors and cameras that help it to navigate and move. It can operate independently or with a human controller for more difficult tasks. Boston Dynamics is expected to give more updates soon on the robot's other interesting abilities. This is great news for those who've always wanted a dog but don't like the idea of fur, poop or walking. This could be the perfect companion. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks, Claire. Well, Spot Mini, a smaller version of Spot and looks, you know, a bit like a brontosaurus or a giraffe. Have you seen that thing? It almost looks like a CCV TV camera with legs. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I'm just a, a little bit perplexed by how dogs are supposed to be the, a human's best friend, right? Mm-hmm. So they come and sit on your lap and you pat them or whatever. I mean, how would you do that with a robot? It's... It's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, I know I've, I'm really fascinated with the fact that they're developing skin for robots. So I would assume that in the years to come, like these robot dogs, probably aren't going to look dissimilar to the dogs that we know and love today. You know, they're going to end up with like fur and have that sort of tactile feeling as well, surely. <laughs> exactly. Well, my mind's taking me straight to what are they going to eat. <laughs> Well, actually, it'll be a hell of a lot cheaper. I wonder whether people will end up making those decisions. Do I get an you know, actual real-life dog or a robot dog and look at the investment? If I buy a robot dog for $2,000, how much does it cost me for food each week and is that actually cheaper and is it close enough to the real thing that it might be worthwhile and do my kids really know the difference? See, it's good for families like mine. I mean, we're, we're a no-pet family and that's only because of travel and you know wanting to get away without having to uh, have the burden of where to place the dog or the, or the cat or the bird or whatever while we're away. So this absolutely solves that. It really is incredible. We're talking innovation on The In Show, and you can check us out at theinshow.online Facebook and follow The In Show on Twitter as well. Coming up, we speak to a self-made artist who took her schoolgirl love of face painting to then painting bodies, photography, and now she even has her own gallery. Next, it's Emma Hack on The In Show. It's all about innovation. The In Show. Adelaide is starting to be recognised as a smart city, nationally and globally. The City of Churches is rapidly gaining a reputation as the city for innovation. Smart city innovation is becoming a big part of our future. The Adelaide Smart City Studio is supporting people that are creating new smart city products and services for global markets. What we've taken for granted is now being embraced by residents and visitors alike. Adelaide Smart City Studio, creating opportunities. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Luke. And we're from Nervous Res. And you're listening to The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock. And if you've missed an episode, just make sure you subscribe to The In Show podcast on iTunes. The In Show. Well, we're joined by Emma Hack, an Australian artist who's really um, working in a very unique medium. David, um, for those people that don't know Emma's name, they certainly would have seen her work. Absolutely. I mean, she's uh, she's done work for film clips like Gautier, as we mentioned before, and some of the stuff that you can see uh, online, particularly of what she's done, is just unbelievable. Yeah, she really has a unique perspective. Uh, you probably know her as the body painter, but there's lots more to her than that. How did your entrepreneurial journey begin, Emma? Did the body painting come first? Well, yeah, actually it did. Okay. Yeah, well, I started off as face painting when I was, you know, young at school and just earning extra pocket money on the weekend and I'd seen some advertising for the musical Cats and realised that that's sort of what I really wanted to do. And then, yeah, just started painting my sister, like, you know, her face and stuff like that and then face painted for a few years and... Yeah, just to survive, I guess, you know, in my teens, as well as working at Pizza Hut, as you do. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, studied makeup artistry, and that's when my teacher said, hey, look, you know, what you're doing on the face is beautiful. You could do that all over. Why don't you? So I was always pretty shy with my own body, so I found it, like, kind of confronting to do it. But also I love the whole idea that you could change the shape of somebody with, you know, I guess the illusion of body art. Mm. And so at the time, you know, that you decided to really step into it, you know, in further study, did you realise how good you were at that point or did it take others recognising it in you? Yes, I did realise I was good at it. Like I had a gift, but there was no means to use it, you know. Mm. Like I guess back then, you know, I live in the city of churches here in Adelaide yeah. and, you know, it was I was a weirdo painting nude people. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of one of those things. But then I sort of got in, into the club scene around the same time and started doing promotions at nightclubs and then started building, you know, my body painting into the dance shows and performances and parades and stuff there. And then, you know, it was always Emma Hack Presents. And so, like, you know, that audience is now of a mature age buying art. So it's actually turned out to my advantage. But I guess I sort of fly by the seat of my pants with everything I do. And, 
you know, I just sort of wandered along. But it was frustrating in the beginning. And it was also, there was no reference of it. Like, there were no books on body art. You know, it was very, I guess, the contemporary style of body art that I do. Obviously, it goes back Indigenous years. Like, it's one of the first art forms in the world when you think about it. But for me, there was, I didn't know that there was anybody else doing it until the web, you know, interweb started. So, yeah, and that's when I realised there were other people and I sort of connected with them and started getting jobs overseas and it started rolling. So you're clearly pioneering in this area, really. And did you think from the start when you first did your first piece that it would ever go to the extent that it has? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I have extremely pie-in-the-sky ideas and a lot of people um, thought I was nuts and crazy and, you know, how could I make a career out of it? But I think if you put your mind to anything and also... You know, and there's a lot of painters out there. So you're competing with all these painters. But if you're doing something that's fresh and new, maybe it might take you 10 to 15 years to get to the point where your work is appreciated, but you're way ahead of the rest of them that might have started even five years ago. So, you know, it's become very popular in the last, I would say, 10 years, probably since 2005, 2006. Um, it's when my work dropped off overseas and before that I was travelling everywhere but Mac Makeup actually bought out a body paint and then trained all their staff and so therefore everybody around the world was painting of some sort and it was a lot cheaper than hiring a chick from Adelaide in <laughs> Australia to then to go all the way to Dubai or you know Canada or wherever we were going so yeah that work dropped off pretty swiftly but about then, that's when it sort of became, like, I guess, popular. What came up for you when um, you realised that was occurring around you? Because, you know, particularly as a pioneer, here you are, you know, thinking you were the only person doing it, then discovering there were a few others around the world. And by virtue of what you guys have created has become a much bigger thing and now it's sort of being commercialised by other people. Did you see that in any way as, you know, uh, people capitalising on something that you'd created? Look, you know, for me, like, there's other artists that were before me as well. So there's Varushka, who is late 60s, early 70s, used to paint herself into rustic walls and backgrounds. Um, she worked as a performance artist. She was also, like, you know, I guess the the first sort of supermodel. Um, it's a very famous photo of her in a safari suit with the big hair and, you know, her Brits shot her back in, like, you know, black and white photo. She, you know, so she sort of started doing what I do now, I guess. You know, and then obviously there's traditional. So I don't think everything, anything is ever new. I think it's the way that you approach something. So for me, like, I always wanted to blend someone into a background, but I didn't want to do it the way Farushka had done it. So in 2005... The idea had been like in my back of my mind and my husband in particular, Justin, he said to me, like, you have to do this. And I'm like, oh, don't like the rustic thing, you know, it's not really my bag. And then I saw the wallpapers of Florence Broadhurst and I started doing that and that's how sort of, you know, I guess I sort of catapulted myself within the art scene um, and started selling on that side and that sort of took over from the live gig thing and travelling the world. So, you know, everything sort of had this sort of general direction and flow. So, yeah. And and was it like the, this whole reinvention thing? I mean, there's something that comes up for us often is how people have to continually reinvent what they do. And is this something that just sort of happened fairly recently for you or is this something that you kind of planned that might emerge or did you just sort of fly with an opportunity? Um, for me, like also living in Adelaide, like a hair and makeup artist, uh, working in advertising and stuff like that. So here in Adelaide, you do everything. You know, if you're in Sydney, there's a makeup person, there's a hair person, there's a stuff. But for here in Adelaide, I was doing styling, hair, makeup, set build, everything. And for me, I've always had my hand in many pies to survive here. So it's just sort of what sort of took off. But the background has always been the art and that's what's been important to me. Mm. And um, the rest of it has fueled that though. It's like everything that I've learned from working within the advertising industry has helped me with the direction now that I take my business in, how I think about what I do. And then, of course, you know, all the hair and makeup that I was doing, it refines what I do. So when you look at body artists, there's body artists that come from a hair and makeup background, and then there's body artists that come from an art background. I sort of come from both. So it's interesting to sort of see, you can really pick the difference, you know, the finished quality of work from a hair and makeup artist, but they may not be as able to paint. So, yeah, it's a funny thing, but there are some really gifted people out there now, and to be honest, like, much more gifted than I am, but I feel that I've really hit my niche at the right time and it's be hard to catch up to that. You know, you mentioned early that um, you know, some of the early adopters of the, um, what you were doing were people that were working within music. Is that where you first found uh, those that were willing to have their entire bodies painted? 
you know, I was just painting my friends. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think, um, you know, and, uh, and I guess, you know, working in the, you know, advertising modelling industry, you know, there's models and stuff that were, you know, I, I remember a modelling agency refusing to give me models, you know, saying that, you know, like, I can't believe what you're doing, you know, body painting, you're not body painting my models. So I guess, you know, crashing through those barriers is, you know, a, a main thing. And I guess the music industry, you know, I worked with the Audrey's quite a bit on their first um, few albums and um, body painted Tash as well for... Um, you know, one of their songs as well, uh, which was a stop animation piece actually before the Gautier. So if you're like mm-hmm. keen to sort of find that, we could Google that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when the Gautier thing came out, you know, that was really, uh, I guess that idea I've had for ages because I sort of worked at Anifex here, uh, which is the animation studio here in Adelaide, and I'd created work for them before, like on set, um, but not animation. And I always was fascinated by it. So when Natasha Pincus, who's the director and producer of the Gautier video clip, she contacted me. She said, I've got this idea to blend, you know, somebody into a wall with stop motion. And I was like, excellent, that's an idea I've had, but it needs to be done properly. Who is the artist, you know? And at that time, Wally wasn't as well known. And um, I think two years prior, he had a song called Your Heart's a Mess come out. Mm-hmm. And, and I Googled him and I found that song and I thought, oh, that's the guy who sang that song. And his voice was so amazing. I said, yeah, okay. And so that's how it all happened. <laughs> wow. And what did that mean for you? I mean, that song was number one all over the world. Yeah, it was really surreal. Actually, to be really quite honest with you, it was a really difficult shoot. Um, it was 23 hours straight, a very emotional thing to do, and I couldn't watch it for quite some time, probably almost up to a year, and really not feel feel what I felt on that day. Mm-hmm. And it's not because of who was there, everybody was great, and you know, it, but it was an extremely difficult shoot to do. And, you know, there were times where I couldn't even read what you know, direction I was going in, especially with Kimber's back because that came down on a horizontal but it had to be applied up on all these sort of angles and you couldn't put a pinpoint of where you were, where was that straight line you were going to but I also couldn't see what was behind her at that time either. So, like, yeah, it was an incredibly difficult shoot. So, yeah, I, I didn't enjoy it as much until, as I said, you know, I was just saying before, you know, like it came into the studio now and just heard the song on the radio and actually um, felt like singing it. <laughs> That's a good six, six years to get over it, so maybe childbirth or something. You know? <laughs> so perhaps just explain to us a little bit about the process that you go through when you do paint somebody and, and just about those difficulties. You talked about not being able to see the background and those sorts of things. Uh, just maybe could you share with us a little yeah. bit about you, well, how you the do way, it? The way I set up my work is I either paint background or the wallpaper I've used in the past is Florence Broadhurst, is iconic Australian wallpaper designer. I hang the background and I set up my camera and that's my viewpoint. So perspective is everywhere, just straight through the camera. So my model will stand in position and I'll sort of line up the background with how I want it to relate to her. And if I painted the background, I sort of I have an idea of where the body's going to sit within the work. And then, yeah, I look through a camera, I run over and paint a line, usually I start on top of the shoulders and then I run back and I make sure it lines up and then I keep on going backwards and forwards. I probably do it the hardest way possible. I'm sure that you can project or have a screen set up on your side. Usually if I did like major commercial work, I'd do that. But to be honest, when I'm creating, I like it to be really organic. And especially if I was creating her work, I found like I wanted to have a bit of Emma in it. So there was a little bit of freedom and push in the actual work that was on the body. So it wasn't just so structured and regimented to Florence. And I guess towards the end especially, that was a frustration for me is just recreating somebody else's work. So it takes like 8 to 15 hours. I was going to say, you how know, long does it it's take? It's crazy. And yeah. the models have to stand there pretty much the whole time. We can break, but the longer you break, the longer it takes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just sort of, I work with quite similar girls all the time, mainly because it's just easier that way and they know what they're getting themselves into and some yeah. people can really do it and some people really can't. Some people faint and, you know, mm. all those things. And when someone faints, they sweat and then the paint's water-based and you're kind of like retouching everything. So, you know, and it's quite common for someone to pass out because they're sort of trying to hold still so much that their concentration is a lot more than what they ever thought it would be. Mm. But yeah, it's, you know, it's an interesting art form to do. And also the other side of it now, as I'm getting older, like I'm 45 now, and I love the fact that my girls are getting older with me and I'm still working on them and they still want to be part of the process. And, you know, the whole ageing philosophy in society now is like something 
that needs to be embraced a little bit more. So for me to paint an 18 year old now for one of my artworks doesn't really make any sense unless I'm making a comment on Gen Z or something, you know? Mm. Um, so for me, it's important to keep on painting the people that I've painted in the past as well. And do you go into these shoots with an actual preconceived idea of what you're going to do on the body or is this something that is part of that creative process that just... You know, if I, if I went in one day and created something and then I went in the next day and created something, they would never look the same and I would never want them to look the same and I would never go back and create again. So whatever you see of my work is the one time I did it. I don't like being stuck mm. <laughs> so or regimented, like all put into like a box and to create. So like I'm, I've never probably been very interested in film work, for instance, because continuity is just a nightmare and not enjoyable for me at all, especially with body painting because I really love the freedom and flow and I think, you know, there's different energy on different days from different people as well, like what they might want to bring to the shoot as well, depending on how they feel. You know, sometimes they're having a good or bad day, but, you know, you can always draw emotionally on that in the actual artworks when you're directing at the end. So, you know, that kind of thing is interesting. How do you cope with, you know, all the investment that you've just talked about and then when there's something hanging in a gallery, someone stands in front of that piece and just makes a judgment then and there? Yeah, that's the hardest thing also about owning your own gallery is that you do hear that and, you know, I go to art fairs and sell my work now as well. Um, But I'm really quite disconnected from my work when I've done it Um, and I know what I like and I'm okay if, you know, I think art should offer commentary anyway. Mm. Um, To be honest and I think... You know, I've had someone sort of stand and go, oh, I don't like that piece as much as that piece, you know, but that's okay because everyone has different, you know, I guess ideas of what their aesthetic, their ultimate aesthetic is. Mm. Um, and that's not a huge concern for me at all. Like now I'm sort of probably a bit thick skin, but in the back of the day it probably hurt a bit. It's innovative body paint installation and photography artist Emma Hack on the in show with David Grice and Troy Sincock. And next we'll find out about the environment Emma creates in and how she finds her inspiration. Download the Phoner app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better and get connected using Phoner. That's spelled P-F-O-N-R, Phoner. Available in the App Store now. Hi, I'm Louise Nobes from Inspired By and you're listening to The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on The In Show. Subscribe to iTunes and listen to The In Show podcast for more innovations. Today we're speaking to Emma Hack. Emma, do you have anything around you that it helps inspire your creativity as you're doing your art? Uh, is there any music playing or some inspirational words that you're hearing or is it just something that you do in silence? Yeah, no, I'm not an inspirational word kind of person, but I'm very, I like to, well, music, I'll, I'll tend to start on something that's really just quite calm because I'm feeling my energy is quite, I'm very anxious in the beginning because I'm anxious about how the other person's going to deal with it more than me. It's, um, or if I haven't done a design before, it's, or it's geometric in some way, which is always the hardest, you know. I've sort of got my own emotional issues with doing that, but I like to push myself, so I throw myself in it anyway. But, yeah, so I will listen to something more calm and just sort of chill out, and then, you know, you sort of get halfway through and you get that crazy... You know, when you're working for so long doing something, you start to get that crazy in your head, and then I just sort of pump the music up a bit (laughs) to try and get through that. And then towards the end, like the last hour or so, it's more important for me to get the model into the right zone because they're in quite a bit of pain by then, to be quite honest with you. You imagine standing, like, for that amount of time and your back sort of compacts in and it's just not great. So I just sort of ask them what they want to listen to and then I sort of talk them through, you know, what I want from them, like, you know, when when we're photographing the work so that we're ready to go, you know. Sort of if they need to be energised, I'll energise them. If they need to be more, you know, relaxed in that process, then I'll speak to them more in a relaxed tone. Um, For me, like, if they don't perform or, like, I'm stuffed, aren't I, really? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, that's really important is the end, I guess, the result and and them feeling good, not necessarily worrying about myself so much. Mm -hmm. What about those, you know, when you said you started painting bodies, there was really something there for you in terms of how, you know, bodies were looked at and and perceived. Is is that still part of your work now? Particularly you're saying you're quite happy to work with, you know, people as they're ageing as you do. Yeah. Are you still sort of feeling that's a motivator in some way? Um, Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. And I'm still in that same zone. Like, for me, I always 
it's really important that the person feels comfortable in front of me. Yeah, I don't even know really how to explain it, but for number one is for me to make them feel as comfortable as possible. And I also have a, a male assistant, so, you know, I tend to send him out while I'm starting off unless it's the same person, bef- like, you know, that I've used before. I do think that the PC in society now has just gone out of control. Like, I really feel it, especially within... You know, I get asked to do live gigs and they want, like, full coverage of the top and full coverage of the bottom. And I, I can't even work like that, you know, mm. like, because it looks like you're trying to cover something. It's yeah. like, stupid. Um, <laughs> but I think the society has almost gone backwards. Like, yeah. in the beginning, it was very free, but it was, like, what are you doing kind of thing. Whereas now I find that people are very close-minded. Mm. Especially, mm. I guess, with what's happening around the world with governments and the really conservative choices that are being made. Mm-hmm. Mm. So tell us, Emma, about the, the current work that you, you have. Um, we've had the pleasure of having a look at some of it online and all that sort of thing. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, the new work's actually like a really big transition for me. So it's a geometric collection and I've really wanted to do... I guess I've never really seen myself as a photographer. I've been photographing since... 2007 Um, and I almost did it as a means to an end for me to create just to sort of capture what I'd done otherwise the photographer is seen as the artist and Mm -hmm. you're just merely I don't know chopped liver I guess Mm -hmm. (laughs) so uh, I started photographing my work but I never like I haven't ever bought a camera or anything like that I just hire everything Mm -hmm. because I don't shoot that often Mm -hmm. and um for this particular collection, I actually felt like a photographer in a way. And probably many people will say, oh, yeah, Emma, don't be so silly, you've been a photographer the whole time. But mm-hmm. I guess for me, I've worked with like a really amazing photographers all around the world and I know how much time and energy they put into their craft and I sort of felt like I hadn't done that. But I put the time and energy into the other side of my craft. So, yeah, the new collection is sort of very sculptural and it's based on like a very athletic form which I really like and I think, you know, it's um, that's probably a really healthy image to have of the human form. But what I really love is the background's very flat and sort of, you know, straight edge lines and then you've got this human body that has the same print over the top of it but because they're contorted or there's a flow to the work and I find that's really interesting. Um, I had a bit of a hiatus from body painting for a couple of years and went into doing embroidery and ceramics and all these other things, you know, and I think you get to a point in your career where you think, You don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had come to that point where I wasn't enjoying the body art so much, to be quite honest with you, and I felt like I was just doing it because other people wanted me to do it. Mm -hmm. And so... How did you go through that and and get out the other side now? I opened a gallery. (laughs) 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 I opened a a gallery in North Adelaide for two years. I was just there for over two years. And what I did was I made it my studio. So I've never really had a studio before because, as I said, I sort of create like... Um, I, I create like really quickly so if I have a deadline I'll usually work up like really tight to it I'm the chick that did homework like the night before it had to be in kind of thing so the same <laughs> thing sort of applies to everything I do but it allows me to sort of think about what I'm doing and get to the point where I'm really happy with what I'm doing like if I created it too early before the exhibition I might change my mind and not include it so this way I have to push myself into doing it and I'm really manic and my husband really doesn't like me when I'm going through that phase because it's <laughs> not easy to live with me. I'm like, it's only two weeks of your life you're putting up with me like this. Anyway. <laughs> oh, this I've year. lost my Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so I opened a gallery and, yeah, and so I created, like, a space in which I could create and people would come and watch me create and therefore it would make me do it, yeah? So otherwise I'd just sit at home and go, oh, no, I can't be bothered stitching today or whatever. Like, I'm not the artist that can sit every day and create art. Like, for me, it's more in my mind and then produce it. So, and get inspired and then produce it. Mm. Not, like, I, I'm not so, reg- I'm not regimented, but a lot of artists are and can sit and do that for hours. And most of them are painterly artists and it takes, you know, anything up to years to make a piece of artwork. So those people, you know, they have to be like that. So, uh, yeah, and I created a few, like, really cool collections, you know, with stitching and... I love the embroidery. Like, there's some really beautiful pieces. Um, but at the time, and then I hurt my shoulder. I got an embroidery injury from, like, 15-hour <laughs> days of embroidery. <laughs> and, and I started thinking, you know, like, maybe it is easy to go back to body painting. <laughs> it's such an easy thing. It comes so naturally to me. So I feel like, you know, I learnt that really I did have a gift and maybe I didn't appreciate it as much as what I should have. And now I appreciate it again. And I guess where I'm at now is that I sort of, realistic about where I'm at 
So I'll create a couple of collections a year and then by moving out of the gallery, I've been doing a bit of community service and things like that in that space and sort of giving back to sort of, I guess, the area and things like that. And I really felt like I wanted to move that forward, but I was burning out doing it and trying to work out how the best way of doing that is. So um, I've been running an art prize for four years and so I've put together a collective with all my art prize finalists and now I'm showing them in a gallery space and giving them opportunities to show their art. And to be honest, we've been open for four days and we've sold like 12 works already, wow. which is great. Wow, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the artists are really happy and I'm taking them to Hong Kong in March and all these other little things. So by doing that, I guess it becomes a business, but I'm able to help people and I can still feel the community side. So that's kind of where I am. I'm going mm-hmm. back into the gallery thing again, but this time being realistic and really focusing on my collections to be really, really strong body mm-hmm. artwork and things that haven't been done before is ultimate for me. Like I always want to be sort of first at trying something. Like, um, I don't know if you remember the crash car yep. the motor accident commission. Yes. So um, the body sculpture of 17 people painted as a car and then that's sort of become a very big wild, wild, worldwide body art thing. Like there's this amazing guy over in um, Italy called Johannes Stodder and he's now, you know, really taken that and, you know, the contortion of bodies and making animals and things like that. And, you know, he's become quite famous from doing it, which is really great. So there's movements that are happening from things that I have maybe triggered ideas with, with what I've done. Um, no one's ever done the Gautier thing, though, again. <laughs> the stop motion body art, obviously, is like a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of funny. But it is nice, I think, and I'm not interested in doing, you know, the sculptured body art thing. It's just like, that was nuts, mm-hmm. you know. Like I feel, and I feel like I did it. I did it really well. I was asked to do it again for a really big campaign and but I wasn't incredibly happy with I didn't think the result would look as good so there's no point in me doing it again Mm -hmm. so I guess you know where I am in my art career is that I make the choice of whether I decide to work with a company or do something or not and not just take it for the money because yeah if you're not moving forward I don't want to move backwards so I Mm. think that's really a good thing to do. Mm. You're really hard decision at times when you know you're you know living in the art world and you know you don't necessarily have that you know weekly wage like everyone yeah. else has in other jobs. So to to say no to something and know that you yeah. might not know what's on the other side of it, you'd have to really back yourself in. Yeah, 2009, 2010, that really happened. Like it was honestly, it was a ten double page spread in Harper's Bazaar for Fendi. And it was like, it would it would have launched my career. So the Gautier thing was like my sort of reconciliation for what happened with this situation. And um, and I said, oh, you know, we've got these handbags. And around the time, I think Louis Vuitton were doing, you know, the sort of um, the Japanese designers work with all the cute characters and stuff. And I thought, oh, they're doing something like that. That'd be kind of cool to paint someone into a background, la, la, la. And I jumped online. And the deal was done, like it was well paid, the whole works, you know, like it was it was the launch of me to luxury, you know, land. And um, I looked online to sort of see what they're up and coming and it was all snake and crocodile hand skin, um, skin bags, you know. And I have live animals in my works, like they'd seen the crocodile, obviously, um, which is Florence Broadhurst wallpaper with a girl holding a crop. And I just said to them, I'm like, you know, I can't promote like this product and they're like don't you know who we are (laughs) and I was like well yeah I'm really like I've been crying for 24 hours before I've made this phone call to you but they were absolutely furious and I got really black banned actually after that there was a couple of other jobs I got offered for and they went you know to the directors for whatever reason it was like in Hong Kong so the Hong Kong is a pretty small place doing Mm. events and things like that and they just were like nah and people would come back to me going what have you done you know (laughs) so that really it was quite daunting to do that, but I think it was the right thing to do and I don't think I'd be where I am in art now if I had done that. Mm. Like maybe I'd be rich living in, you know, some fabulous country or who knows, but I'm pretty happy with the decisions I've made and like even if they've been that hard, I think they're worthwhile making. Magnificent, Emma. Thanks so much for joining us on The In Show. It's been great to hear about the evolution of your journey. Now, people, if they want to check out your uh, art, where, where do they need to go? They can go to emmahatgallery.com. Uh, they can also join my Facebook and there's Art Bar Adelaide, which is my new business, I guess. So it's a gallery and a bar, uh, which is always fun. <laughs> 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 Sip on some wine and have a look at some art. Um, and then 
yeah, and then, you know, I'll be travelling to, if, if you're hearing this in Hong Kong, I'll be over for the Asia Contemporary Art Fair in March. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's all about innovation on The In Show and if you know an innovator that we should have on the show, just drop us a line at theinshow.online. You can check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on The In Show. We chat to Melissa Cooper. Now, she's a UX strategist and she specialises in helping organisations adopt a customer-centric approach to strategic product decision-making and the implementation of good customer experiences. And blockchain, Troy, has come up several times on the in-show. And next week, we're going to hit that head on. We've, we've got Frank Falco coming in to unravel the mystery that is blockchain. I tell you what I could do with a bit of unravelling around that one. It's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, we all know exists, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, and what does it do? How is it going to affect our lives in the future? Exactly. Claire's going to be back next week with more innovations from around the world. And check out the inshow.online. Subscribe to iTunes and listen to the podcast and rate us five stars if you like. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed this show this week, Troy. Emma, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, we're going to talk more about what's in next week on the In Show. Now, before we go, here's Moira Deslands from Chooks SA talking about the importance of community and how she built her organisation from a Facebook group. I um, became motivated because a number of young women in particular were telling me they were facing quite a bit of sexism and, you know, just the silly jokes about women in business and things like that. And I just said to them, oh, well, you better fix that up. And they said, actually, no, we'd like you to help us with that. I thought, well, maybe there's a few other people who'd be interested in this. I'll just start a little Facebook group with a few friends and see if they've got any other friends that might be interested as well. And so I just did that for a month or so, and then we launched in May, um, and I thought it'd be really good if we could have 100 members in the Facebook group by May, and we did. And uh, we're knocking on the door of 800 people now, and it's a closed Facebook group, so it is building on the concept that friends invite friends, everything's about relationships, and we know that in if you're trying to build a movement and trying to build collaboration, that's what you need to do. It can't be a free-for-all. It really needs to be connecting and deepening those connections and building the trust. And I think that's one of the problems that in the startup world has got, is that women have felt excluded. Their ways of working haven't often been reflected in the way that a very masculine approach to, you know, gung-ho, let's get out there, let's pitch, 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 rather than taking things in a way that understands the networking nature of how ideas and decisions actually get made. The In Show, brought to you by Adelaide Smart City Studio. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. Presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.